All right. All right, let's give a warm hand for Dan. Cool guys, um, I'm here to talk about using Angela Vault to protect your secrets. So, uh, first and foremost, who am I? I am Dan Davis. Uh, you guys probably know that from the meeting invite. Um, I've been a software developer for about eight years, and I'm back about myself. Uh, so about three weeks ago, I completed my very first half iron hand. So that was really awesome. Um, that was um, I was having a good time. Um, so people, when I tell them this, they say like, oh Dan, that's really crazy that you do this, and, and you know, you're kind of right. Like, but I only think that part of the triathlon is crazy. So, uh, if you've never seen a triathlon swim, like the swim start, that is crazy and ridiculous. <laughs> it is. Uh, everybody in your age group goes all at once into the water. It's like splashing your arms and legs and things like that. And um, it's the only part of the event that's considered a full contact sport. So, I was trying to think of a good picture to just demonstrate that. Or, and I found this one Cliff Bar commercial. So, I wanted to show you guys this. This is what the swim starts like. <laughs> or like, this is what it feels like, I suppose. Just being beaten with, uh, with paddles and stuff. Um, if that looks fun to you guys, I really highly recommend you guys do a triathlon. Um, but yeah, so, anyways. <laughs> um, so seriously though, uh, what about me? Um, so I came from the Java world. Uh, I've been doing Python development for about two years. Uh, and I've also been doing a lot of DevOps work most recently. So lots of quality automation. I'll talk to you off about it. And uh, I've also been doing a lot of work with open source uh, more recently at Excel. So that's been very exciting. And when I was thinking about that earlier, I, I realized we're kind of at a really interesting point in our industry's history. So in the last 10 years, we've seen the rise of two really kind of important uh, technologies or I guess ideas. Uh, the first one is of course open source. We've seen open source become, we've had this idea for a long time but it's become, uh, it's more popular than it's ever been now. And that's really awesome. I think a lot of that has to do with services like GitHub that provide a hosting service for us to upload code and it's open and available and people can collaborate and share. So that has really enabled a lot of the open source movement. On the other side, we have this idea of like cheap infrastructure, or I guess you'd say, you know, servers in the cloud. Um, the idea that you know I don't have to just rent a, a rack space and get them, you know spend two months configuring it. I can just go to the, the cloud and I can pull down a limited number of servers if I want, you know, a dozen servers, a hundred servers, whatever I want. Um, the tooling though to make that happen has had to evolve too. So now we have tools like Ansible, Chef, and Puppet that make that a lot easier. So if I'm provisioning a dozen servers or a hundred servers, that tooling is a lot easier. It's more easy to manage that stuff. So we've got open source and we've got sort of you know, cloud infrastructure. And when you think about these two things together, they actually end up being a really awesome natural fit. Um, this is what's kind of behind the infrastructure as code movement. So the idea that I write down exactly what my code, what my infrastructure does in the form of code. And then I can take that code and commit it to a service like GitHub. Now that code for my infrastructure is publicly available so people can read it, see it, like touch it. That's awesome. It allows us to do two things. So it's accessible to others. Um, before, in the past, we used to have to we used to have to provide all that infrastructure. We used to say, "Here you go. You know, I have to plan for all these people who want to use my service. Now I can just give them a piece of source code and say, stand up your own infrastructure. Here you go. Use one of those cloud providers and do it. Um, that takes the burden off of me. They can set up their own infrastructure if they want. The other thing that's nice is it provides auditability to us. So I know when my infrastructure changes and who changed it and why. Those are really important questions because in the past, it was just some guys in the server room like making changes and pushing, like you may have had some uh, form of logging or whatnot, but it probably wasn't as rigorous as now it's all in code, we can see the git, the git commit history. So that's great, that's all awesome. Unfortunately, there's kind of a darker side to this. And that darker side, we're gonna call the trendy word DevOps. No, sorry, I, I misspelled that, uh, my mistake. That should be DevOps, okay? You're probably wondering, what is DevOps? Well, DevOps is, of course, that moment of shame when you accidentally commit something that you really ought not to have committed to a public repository, like your personal access tokens or your private keys or maybe you know your OAuth secret tokens, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a problem. This is actually such a pervasive problem. GitHub will now automatically revoke any of your personal access tokens that it realizes you've committed. It's like, sorry guys, you are done DevOpsing for the day. You're like, done. 
So why is this bad? Like, so what if my password is out in the open for people to use? <laughs> well, that may sound like a silly question, but I have to answer it. So at this point, um, what, what Google Image Search believes a hacker looks like. Um, <laughs> the idea here is that uh, if, we, if we expose our passwords and our keys and things like that, then basically hackers can really easily trash our infrastructure. They can get in, they can make a whole bunch of changes. So that's, that's unfortunate. It creates a sort of security paradox for us. Uh, the idea here is that we can't commit some types of data, things like our passwords and our uh, API keys and our private keys, that sort of stuff. But unfortunately, those things are actually really critical to provisioning our servers. So we really can't have infrastructure as code sort of like we can either be open source or we can have infrastructure as code, but we can't really be both. And these things that normally seem like a great idea and go together really well are now kind of polar opposites. So this is sort of the, the heart of what we're going to talk about tonight. How can we be both open source and have infrastructure as code? Um, before I dive into that, though, I need to kind of give a little bit of a brief intro to Ansible. So who here in the room has like used or worked with Ansible or at least heard of it? Okay. A handful of folks, you know. Um, I'm going to give you guys like the one minute intro. Um, this is just to sort of acquaint everybody with the terminology. But um, if you really are, are, if you're excited about this, then go check it out. Um, but here's just the the brief intro. Uh, Ansible works like this. You have an inventory file. The inventory file. Its entire purpose is to help us group servers together. So we say. I'm going to have a group of servers that represent my dev servers, my staging servers, my production servers. So this is examples of groups we can make. We then take those groups and we apply them to a playbook. The playbook says, basically, uh, given a group of servers, what are we going to do to those servers? What are we going to, uh, what's the actual thing? We break that up into these little pink boxes. We call them roles. Roles are sort of like these high-level ideas, so like installing Apache or Elasticsearch or standing up a Postgres database, that sort of thing. Those roles can be broken down further into tasks. So a role is just a collection of tasks, and a playbook is just a collection of roles, if that helps. Um, that's the general idea, the general workflow of Ansible. We also have this concept of, just like we have groups of servers, we can have uh, group variables. So I have a, you know, my dev group, and my production group, and my staging group. I might want to apply different variables to those environments, things like my passwords. So it makes sense that the the root password of the database in production is different from the root password in maybe the dead environment. <coughs> and if you've ever used any kind of templating for Django, uh, uh, it's the same thing here. We can basically template that stuff in using a Jinja2 template. Uh, to so we can have a different production password for you know, our database. Uh, we can have the same, uh, we have a password that changes between environments, if that makes sense. Questions before I move on? Shake hands. All right, so that's, that's the whole spiel here, but really we're going to talk about these group box files, because that's really where all of your, most of the time, that's where your secret information is going to live, okay? So, let's talk about Ansible Vault. What is this thing? Well, Ansible Vault comes as part of Ansible, so if you wanted to install it, all you have to do is install Ansible. Um, and the way you do that is with a whole variety of tools, pip, homebrew, apt-get, uh, yum, there's all kinds of ways to do it for all your environments and support it on everything, including Windows now, which is great. Um, so how do we protect our data? Well, the idea here is we're going to take those files and we're going to encrypt them with Ansible Vault. Um, it's going to use the AES-256 encryption. This is our industry standard for encryption. So I think it's uh, uh, rated for like top secret stuff. Um, so that's, that's good. It's standard encryption, uh, modern, modern technology. We're then going to run our Ansible playbooks, and Ansible will handle automatically just uh, decrypting the files at runtime. So all these encrypted files, you know, Ansible will take care of decrypting that for us. And then once we've got those files encrypted, we can now store them safely in GitHub. So I've got my secrets, they're encrypted, I can now put them up into GitHub. So how do we do that? Well, it's really straightforward. There's a command, Ansible vault, encrypt, and then you give it the file name. It'll prompt you for a password, Put in a password twice, now your file is magically encrypted. So here's an example file, something with just a whole bunch of data and information, and if I encrypt it, it'll look something like this. That looks pretty encrypted to me. Um, so, that's cool. 
how do we run this thing? So if I wanted to provision my servers, so I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to apply changes, I'm going to you know stand up a new server, that sort of thing. Um, we'll follow the same general convention, the, the calling the Antwil playbook, providing an inventory file and a, and a playbook. Um, but the only addition we're going to make here is this ask vault pass. So the idea is that now when you run that, it's going to prompt you for a password. That password is what we use to decrypt the file. Um, that allows Ansible to decrypt at a runtime, and magic ensues. Um, so there are a couple of other commands that might be useful here. Um, obviously, there's a corresponding decrypt command, so you can encrypt it, you can decrypt it. Um, I like this middle one here, the edit command. The idea is that it will temporarily decrypt a file in memory, uh, and it will open up in your favorite browser, or sorry, your favorite um, editor, like Vim or uh, Emacs or uh, Sublime, whatever you want. When you close that, uh, that editor, it will automatically re-encrypt your file. So this prevents you from forgetting to accidentally you know, re-encrypt it and having a dev loops moment. Um, there's, also, there's also one for um, rekeying a file. So this is to provide a new password uh, to your Ansible vault. This is useful for when you have people who uh, leave the organization. So if somebody who has production access and they leave, you should always, always, always change all your passwords and things like that. So that's just the best practice for us, and Antwil makes that easy. So what can you encrypt? You know, is it just the just the group parse files? No, it is basically everything. Um, if you want to encrypt your variable files, you can, uh, just like I showed. But you can also do things like your inventory files. So if in your inventory file, you may list out the IP address of servers, and you may want to keep that secret. So you can encrypt the inventory file. Uh, you can encrypt the template. Maybe you have some proprietary like section of configuration you don't want people to know about, you can encrypt that somewhere. Um, tasks, don't want people to know what that, that role does, great, you can encrypt that. Uh, even your playbook, you can encrypt the entire playbook. So really, your options here are kind of limitless. You know, it's, it's only up to your imagination what you can encrypt. Having said that, please don't encrypt everything. Um, this sort of creates this, you know, this like security for people who are like, encrypt all the things, everything needs to be encrypted, and it actually makes your stuff less secure. Um, here's my rationale. It's sort of counterintuitive, but the more people that I need to provide, the more things that I have encrypted, the more uh, the more people I have to provide the password to. So if you give access to everyone in your dev shop, you know the ability to decrypt your production files, then really you're just creating that much more of a security risk. So really here, what we want is uh, so we want to make sure that we're decrypting, or we're only encrypting the things that we need to. Um, the other big piece of this is we lose the commit history. So anytime we, anytime we end up uh, encrypting files, what that will show up as a, in, uh, in git diff is just a whole bunch of random gibberish. And you have no way of understanding, like, well, what changed? Like, what's different? Uh, so if everything is encrypted, you really lose the ability to, to have any history in your, in your files. So obviously the best practice here, just you know, only encrypt the things that you really desperately need to. So they might ask, like, what, how? Like, we just showed me, you know, I just showed decrypting an entire file and making that go. Well, we can we can use a little bit of Ansible magic here, right? We can split up our group parse files. Um, Ansible has a feature that allows us to specify it. it can be either a variable file or it can be a variable directory, right? The idea is that similarly named directory, it'll just go in and everything inside of that directory gets read. Um, let me give an example of this. So here was our original layout, right? I had a group parse folder, and then I had dev, production, staging. Three files, no fuss. Um, now what we're going to have is you know, the same setup, but these things are now folders. And inside of those folders, I have two, two different files, our secrets and our non-secrets. So this ends up being a little more clear what's going to be encrypted and what's not encrypted. Um, the one downside, and one thing I want to caution about this, is watch out for variable fragmentation. Because we're not splitting things up into different files and whatnot, you tend to lose a little bit of context. Uh, let me give an example of this. So here's an example file of, uh, of a group virus file which has information about Postgres. So the host and the username and maybe the port, you know, the database. But it's missing a key piece of information, the password. Where does that information live? I don't know. Did whoever built this file forget to include it? Or is it living somewhere else? You don't have any idea. You, you don't know. Am I supposed to provide that? It's very ambiguous. The better practice is to provide a reference. So here on the bottom, 
we have Postgres password, and we're referencing Ansible vault, right? So just another file, and I usually prefix this with the word vault. So it's extremely clear. This is coming from our secrets folder. So that makes it really easy. Anyone looking at this says like, okay, I get it. I don't even have to be able to, be able to decrypt the file to know where it's coming from. So that's cool, like neat, but you're probably wondering one thing, right? It's, the password prompts are really, really frustrating <laughs> to deal with. You're like, oh, this won't work for my automation, right? I mean, it's good for human beings, it's good for your manually deploying the stuff, but how do I automate this in a way that's secure and safe? That's really, really the name of the game here. So Ansible Vault provides the idea of a password file, but that's really not very good for us here. The idea is that it's a clear text file, it just has your password written in it, you reference it, and it's sort of like, it's, it's kind of ironic, it's like you do all this work to encrypt the file, <laughs> and now you just have this thing sitting there that's just like right next to it. Oh, just to decrypt all, my, all of my production passwords, great. That's not very secure. So let's make that better. Let's deal with this. Um, Ansible sort of has this hidden little secret to it. That password file can actually be an executable file, so it becomes more of a password script. The idea is that anything that comes out of the standard out becomes the password that it does. So it captures anything in standard out, and it uses that as the password. So we can use a really simple little script like this. You know, this just basically has a shebang for Python that says, you know, this is a Python file, and then it goes and prints out the environment variable vault password. So that's really nice, because now that password is stored somewhere else. It's stored in an environment variable, and that environment variable can get there by being in your bash profile, or maybe it's do some Linux magic to get it there. So that's better. That's at least a little easier to work with. The other thing I want to point out about this is that you can use the full power of Python or Bash or Perl or whatever language you want to use. As long as it's got an appropriate shebang, it's an executable file, you can you know, hit a server and grab the value. You could you know, do some kind of fancy lookup, maybe hit a database, whatever you want. So your options here are really uh, limitless on this. Uh, yeah? There's a Python module called Keyring. Uses the keychain on your Mac, the mm -hmm. basic equivalents on GNOME. That is a fine choice for such a thing because Absolutely. things are encrypted, they're separate process protected memory so that arbitrary code running as you can't steal passwords. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. cool. So there's lots of possibilities for this. So this is really an, an incredible way of managing this, uh, this thing. So let's talk about how we would integrate this with continuous integration, right? So now we have this idea of a password script. Let's actually automate stuff. Um, if we were using something like Jenkins, you know, Jenkins is, for those of you guys who don't know, it's a, a free open source uh, uh, automation tool. Uh, there's other ones like uh, Team City or Travis or GoCD, or, you know, any one of those will probably work in this situation, but this is just a good example. Um, the idea in Jenkins is that there's an option to inject passwords. The idea is that it will inject a password into an environment variable for you in your job, and it masks the output. So. It, it'll uh, mask the output and allows you to store that value safely in Jenkins now. So Jenkins owns that information. Um, that's really nice, it's convenient. Now all the things you need to decrypt your file are stored in your job, as opposed to on someone's, you know, on somebody's arbitrary computer or I have to have it sitting somewhere in a bash profile, that sort of thing. Um, this makes our deployments a lot more secure. Uh, the main advantage here, and this will make your security department happy, uh, developers can't deploy to production unless they have that vault password. So if you manage all your secrets in that, you know, in Jenkins, Jenkins becomes the only thing that can deploy. And maybe a handful of people that we trust who may have uh, access to decrypt that file. Also, because Jenkins is managing the password, uh, you know, it's, it's more secure because it's stored inside of Jenkins and it's, uh, it's being managed by, you know, it's in a database somewhere, maybe it's encrypted or that sort of thing. Um, it also makes it really easy for us if we ever want to change that, so we have one place that we have to change it. So somebody leaves the organization, we decide to rekey all the files, we change it in one place, and everything works. All of our deployments continue to work. So that's really awesome, that's a, a nice way of doing it. Um, that's really all there is to putting it into continuous integration, just injecting the stuff in it as an environment variable and having an appropriate script that reads that. But I wanted to take it a little, a little bit further and kind of head off some questions. So. There are a few things I want to point out, especially whenever we talk about security, because there's always like a little bit more you want to say about security. Um, first and foremost, encrypting files in GitHub. 
some people will shake their heads at this because they'll say, well, Dan, technically that file could still be compromised because you can clone that repository and then take your supercomputers and your <laughs> GPU processors and just really wail on that particular file. Okay, you know, again, we're using strong encryption, we're using our industry standards, like, it should be safe, but maybe. The, I, I, I'll grant it, right? So anyone is able to clone that file, they could attempt to brute force it. If this is a concern for your organization, uh, one easy way to address this is you could just try putting those encrypted files in the private <laughs> <laughs> Now, now all that information is like, you know, hidden away. So now only people who have access to the private repo can download and clone that file. Um, that's great. That works. Only downside is that private repos cost money. But chances are, if this is a concern for your organization, you're probably large enough where you can pony up the cash. Um, so. Taking that one step further, you could say, well, Dan, but the thing is is that even if it was in a private repo, somebody somebody like a GitHub employee <laughs> could still compromise your file because they might have access to it, right? This is essentially more or less the argument. It's you're hosting it in the cloud somewhere, so somebody might be able to steal it because it's in the cloud. Um, in this case, you know, if that's a concern for your organization, maybe what you say is, why don't we buy a, a copy of GitHub Enterprise? GitHub Enterprise allows us to run this, uh, run a version of GitHub, but on your own infrastructure, on your own service. So uh, I have all that stuff, and it's, you know, I own the infrastructure, I can secure it, I can do whatever lockdown things that I need to do in order to feel safe and happy about that. Um, and then you can still do your deployments, pull these files in. Um, the idea here is that your Ansible scripts, things like that, can still remain public, just the things that are encrypted can be hidden away in some special uh, in some special private repository or some GitHub Enterprise version. Um, for an open source project, I think this is more than sufficient, these options. Um, I think this should be fine for everybody's open source project. Anything beyond this, and it really kind of gets into tinfoil hat land, <laughs> like, I'm really paranoid about everybody being able to attack everything in my infrastructure, we don't really need to go there. So um, I provided some links for you guys. It's really one, one source. Uh, they have a, Ansible Vault has a, uh, instructional page. If you go there, uh, follow the instructions. It's very simple. I also have a link to uh, this presentation on SlideShare, and I'll tweet this out at uh, Django District tonight. In case you guys want to uh, reference it, look at it. That sort of thing. Cool. Uh, that's all I have. Questions? And that's part of the core, right? Yes, it's part of Ansible Core. So it uh, comes with Ansible for free. Yes? So if you're going the um GitHub enterprise route, or say your project actually isn't even open source, mm -hmm. why would you still want to do this? So there's less incentive if it's if it's closed source, but you know a lot of it I think has to do with uh, good data management practices. So it's like just because it's not open source doesn't mean that somebody might, you know, so an, an inside employee or something like that, mm -hmm. it's better to say, well, even if that were the case, our data is encrypted because we care about our data. You know, so I think there is good incentive. Plus, it's not particularly onerous to do this. If it was a lot of work, I'd say like, yeah, you know, there's benefits and trade-offs. This should be dirt simple, and it fits into the process really easily, so it's almost transparent. Um, so there's a lot of incentive to do it, even if it's not open source. Other questions? Yes? How would you update uh, an encrypted file? Would you just decrypt it temporarily? Yes. Okay. So, so the idea is you can either edit it uh, using that uh, Ansible Vault edit command, or you decrypt it if you're doing it for a longer period of time, you know, and then just re-encrypt the file with the same key. Um, and one thing I, I uh, didn't um, mention here is uh, you have to have the same key across all of your stuff, or at least all the things when they run. So you can have different keys for uh, dev staging and production, but you can't have different keys within like the dev, you know, within the same run of Ansible Vault. So I was going to ask, um, would it mess it up if two people opened it up to edit at the same time? Oh, like on the same computer? So supposedly it's supposed to open it in memory in its own little location. Okay. So like two people on the same on the same server, right? Right. Yeah, it should be in its own little, but I've never actually tried that. <laughs> um, but, you know, in general, like editing should be like, on your own laptop, or like you know, on your, you you wouldn't necessarily want it on the server. Have you ever encountered a merge conflict with the encrypted file? Ooh, so like, <laughs> so that totally can happen because if two people edit it, right, yeah. and they edit the same, and then they 
both try or like mm -hmm. you edit it and then it's you know you didn't pull down their changes you can get a merge conflict that's that sucks. Um, <laughs> but if you're if you're following good practices, you really shouldn't be changing that file too much. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, only the things that need to be encrypted are in there. So hopefully, you guys coordinate when you're changing like your server passwords and things like that. What I was going to say, I noticed that on your example of the stage of introduction, you had three secrets. Yes. Do you necessarily have to have that in the dev? You could just leave it the way it was. Any developer screws it up, that's just development. You can track that down. Oh, three what now? So you had three secrets, right, for each environment. Mm -hmm. um, could you still just set it up with like staging and production with encryption, but not do that in development? Yes. So the idea is, um, yeah. So I, I've done this before with like uh, one of my big tenets is I want to have an open source project and I want to have a version that people can run locally. Right? And then the local file is, you know, has the template that people would follow if they were going to deploy to different environments. So you can leave that unencrypted. Just remember that when you like when you run your playbook command, you don't need to decrypt anything, so just don't include that. But yes, that's absolutely doable. Like you don't have to encrypt everything. You can just, you know, encrypt one environment or another. Other questions? I have one. Yeah. Um, this is more just a general Ansible question, and maybe we can open it up to the room. But I've never, I always kind of assumed that Ansible Tower was like the selling point on that was that they would help you with this credential management and stuff like that. So I guess my real question is like, what does Tower, or why would I pay for Ansible Tower? That's ever. That's an excellent question. I don't know because I have never paid for Ansible Tower. Um, I hear it's a nice product, but uh, I haven't seen anything where I'm like, I desperately need that, you know. Uh, especially because I feel comfortable doing this. Like, I don't think this is a particularly onerous thing to do. So I feel comfortable, you know, telling my organization, we're going to do this, you know, and I, I believe in this process. Yeah. So it's, I actually really appreciate the fact that um, the Ansible team, like, makes this available, makes it easy instead of intentionally making it hard. The uh, tower is, is, in my understanding, because I've never used anything like a command line, is actually for more of a GUI kind of thing. Right. So, like, you really okay. wanted somebody else that could do it with the GUI interface, but you can do every all the power is still there with the command lines. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Well. It's like it's all just GUI driven, so it's like a little more hand holding, a little easier to do. Um, that sort of thing, making it simpler for people who are not necessarily developers. Yeah. Yes. I think you may have actually just answered this question in the previous answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. All right. So if you had an open source project and you actually wanted people to be able to use it. They wouldn't if it, every if all of the passwords were encrypted, right? So they right. would they would fork it and be like, oh, what's going on? Mm -hmm. But so the way you get around that is how? So uh, one of the things that I like to do is I'll have uh, four environments, right? So dev staging, production, and then local, and maybe that local builds to like an Ansible, oh, sorry, um, a Vagrant box or something like that. And the idea is like, you know, okay, you want to get started with my project? Here's the Vagrant box, you know, just hit Vagrant up, it spins up, it deploys everything, gives you the model for it, you know, and you can play around with it, do its thing. Um, and then if you want to deploy this, this same thing to your, uh, to your own infrastructure or whatnot, you just need to copy the values in that local, uh, that local file and, you know, dump those things in. So it, it provides the template for them okay. as opposed to kind of like, Good luck figuring that out, you know. <laughs> but it, it should at least that's that's the model I like to follow is having a local environment as well. Okay, cool. That vacuum cleaner is getting closer. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. Cool. Thank you.